the end of the presentation answering your questions. Imagine the frustration of having a continuous painful disorder that cannot be definitively diagnosed with any test or x-ray, interferes with eating, becomes progressively worse with time, has no known cause, and for which there is no highly effective treatment. This is what patients with burning mouth syndrome deal with every day of their lives. And I didn't make this up. This is from the California Dental Association Journal um, article in August 2006. I am a functional medicine and anti-aging and restorative medicine doctor, and I've spent over the last decade, more than the last decade, treating and researching this puzzling disorder. And I found some solutions. And I'm going to tell you how I got there, and we're going to talk about um, how to know if you have burning mouth syndrome, what the evaluation should entail, and what the treatment options are, and what the future looks like for you. I call this burning mouth syndrome solving the puzzle because right now it's a puzzle. We have some understanding of what burning mouth syndrome is, but there's a lot that we still need to learn. This is a testimonial that I got very early in my work as a functional medicine doctor. This is a woman who was a fitness professional and after being on our hormone restoration program, which she came to see me because she was having the typical perimenopause and menopausal symptoms of hot flashes, mood problems, weight gain, um, all the typical things that we see. She left this testimonial on my website. She said, I've noticed increased muscle definition after two months on my hormone program. I'm sleeping better. My burning tongue is not nearly as bad. My mood swings are not as intense and I feel great. And honestly, I put this testimonial up and didn't think too much about the burning mouth part of it, but then I had people start to get in touch with me. And so I went on a mission um, to try to figure out what was going on, what burning mouth syndrome is, why a hormone program would make it better, and what that means as far as our understanding and where to go in the future. This is the definition from the International Headache Society. Now the International Headache Society doesn't just deal with headaches, it deals with all types of head, mouth, and neck pain. And their definition is that burning mouth syndrome is a burning sensation for which no dental or medical cause can be found. Uh, the International Journal of Oral Science said the patient with a complaint of a burning sensation in the oral mucosa, which is the lining, the name of the type of smooth lining in your mouth, presents one of the most difficult challenges to the care professional. So it's well recognized in the medical and dental establishment that burning mouth presents a challenge. And this is another quote from that same article. Most clinicians dread seeing the patient presenting with a primary complaint of burning pain. They dread seeing you. Why is that? Why do they feel like that? They don't have an effective solution. And those of us that are care professionals what we want is for people to feel better. And when they don't feel better, we feel like our, we're not doing our jobs. And so it ends up being really somewhat fearsome to face somebody and feel like you can't do anything for them and you know they're, they're in distress. And these are some of the symptoms. Um, first and foremost, is the same feeling in your mouth as if you drank something too hot and it burned your mouth, that it feels scalded. Daily, to be um, considered burning mouth syndrome by definition, it needs to be happening every day and be a deep burning sensation. Some people have the intensity of the pain constantly throughout the day. Some people wake up in the morning and the pain's not so bad and it gets worse through the day. I've talked to people whose only relief is when they're sleeping and they keep wanting to take naps all day because that's their only relief from pain. The intensity is considered moderate to severe, similar to a toothache. Well, toothaches are pretty severe pain. So 
we don't have a way of really measuring pain other than people telling us how bad it is, but um, generally in medicine, it's known that toothache is pretty severe pain. Some people find that when they eat or drink, it feels better. Other people find that it feels worse. For some people with burning mouth syndrome, their sleep is interfered with. And like the example I told you about somebody I talked to this week, her only relief was when she slept. So it's really variable. And where does it happen? Well, the most common thing I see happen is pain or scalded feeling that starts at the tip of the tongue. And it ends up most often being in the front two thirds of the tongue. The medical name is anterior or front. Um, we see it also on the hard palate, the front of the hard palate. I've had many people tell me that inside their lower lip, that shiny tissue called the mucosa burns, um, and often it's in more than one site. And it very often travels over time. So it may start on the tip of the tongue, and then it travels to one further back on the tongue on one side, then it may go to the other side, it may go to the cheeks, um, and it can go even further. And I've talked to people, and I had somebody contact me recently who said their eyes and their nose bothered them. I've seen that, where nasal passages are burning all the way up into your eyes, your eyes are burning and tearing, all the way down into your lungs and bronchial tree is burning, and even skin surfaces. So the example of the testimonial I gave you of the fitness professional that was the first person I encountered with this, she had burning on her back, on, the, on her shoulders and her upper back that came at the same time as her mouth was burning. So we know that this process, this burning can be, occur in many different places. And again, for the official definition is it needs to be present at least two hours a day, the burning. It needs to be over three months to be considered a chronic pain syndrome, which is what burning mouth is and not have any evident cause. So one of the things that we are challenged with doing as patients and also as physicians is to figure out if there's some other treatable cause that we need to address that can give a person relief. One of the discouraging things about burning mouth syndrome is it can take a very long time to diagnose and people often see multiple, multiple specialists. Um, I had somebody tell me that she had burning for a year and was really depressed. She had a history of depression previously. It got worse with the development of her burning tongue. The tip of her tongue burns. Her taste sensation is abnormal, and we'll get into that. And she told me she had spent $12,000 on treatments that were unsuccessful. I had somebody contact me um, in regards to this webinar who said, I've seen every kind of doctor you can imagine from A to Z. I have pain 24-7. And when I got so discouraged and felt like I couldn't stand the pain anymore, they admitted me to a psych hospital for seven days. So it didn't help my pain and it was a humiliating experience. So we know that patients go from doctor to doctor to doctor to make a diagnosis. I had one patient tell me her primary care doctor said, well, I've got good news for you and bad news for you. The good news is I know what you've got, it's burning mouth syndrome. The bad news is I don't know what to do to help you. And this is what patients confront over and over. And so because it's in the mouth, many people go to see dentists, oral surgeons, uh, ear, nose, and throat specialists, wondering if it's an allergic problem, seeing allergy doctors, um, seeing their usual family practice doctors in internal medicine, and um, alternative health practitioners as well. And how does the disease go? Well, some people, remember the month it happened. It was pretty sudden onset. They connect it with something that's gone on in their lives. They had dental work done. They had a traumatic experience. They were on um, steroid hormones, a whole variety of um, different kind of precedents um, that they remember pretty specifically when it started. Other people kind of start having burning. It feels like their tongue was scalded, not all the time. And then as time goes on, it becomes more distinct, more progressive, and, um, and is there more of the time. 
Um, half of patients have onset of pain and can't connect it to anything. And then like it says here, a number of people will relate it to dental work, to an illness or a medication. And so far, we really don't know of the connection that any of these things actually causes burning mouth. And we all certainly desire to try to figure out what caused it. And so we will often put it together with something else that happened at the time. I can tell you stress and trauma definitely are connected. Um, there's been a lot of work done to see if dental work, if certain um, dental um, composites, uh, people are allergic to them, and that really hasn't panned out as a reason for burning mouth syndrome. And how does the disease go? Well, symptoms usually go on for months or years. One of the articles that I read said that there is spontaneous and partial recovery in 20% of patients after six to seven years. And that recovery usually, um, it's not that it goes away, but the symptoms become more intermittent. However, for the bulk of people, it doesn't usually get better on its own. We certainly don't see the people for whom it's gotten better on its own. We see the people who have seen all the doctors from A to Z and taken months and years to get diagnosed and not found a solution. There are other symptoms that are associated. 70% of people have altered taste perceptions, which can be really distressing, a feeling of a metallic taste in their mouth or a salty taste, food doesn't taste right, um, a sensation of dry mouth, and I write a sensation of dry mouth because when studies have been done in burning mouth syndrome patients and saliva is actually measured, the saliva production is measured, it's normal saliva production, but the feeling is that your mouth is dry and uncomfortable and difficult to eat, difficult to process food in your mouth, difficult to swallow. And we certainly see anxiety and depression and stress. And I'll get into these as we go. So how do we make the diagnosis? So here's some things, if you're having a problem with pain in your mouth, burning on your tongue, here are some things that you can take a look at, try to see if you have. Is there a white coating on your tongue? Thrush, which is also yeast infection of the tongue, can give you a white or gray coating, and there can be a lot of discomfort with that. Are there little blisters, herpes, or shingles infections? It can give a lot of pain and burning, and um, will show up as tiny blisters either on the tongue or inside the mouth or on the lips and face. Are there white or purplish gray patches? There is something called lichen planus, which is um, an autoimmune, uh, partially autoimmune cause, also partly could be caused by a virus. No one is completely sure what lichen planus is, but it creates pain in the mouth. So it's discrete little patches um, that might be Oh, the size of a diameter of a pencil eraser or smaller. And then is there low salivary flow, which is something that is hard to measure yourself, but dentists who specialize in these kinds of problems can evaluate salivary flow. And I'll explain why that's an important distinction in a little while. You want to rule out that there is something going on in the mouth causing an irritation or burning. So a dental prosthesis, a bridge, a crown, something like that that's rubbing and causing pain. And contact hypersensitivity to dental materials, which hasn't in fact been shown to be a cause of burning mouth syndrome, but some people might possibly have that as a cause of irritation in their mouths. You wanna look at whether you have allergies to foods, the flavorings, the additives, fragrances that you're using on your body? Is there anything caustic that you're using? Um, are you eating a lot of acidic foods? Um, do you have a, a kind of chronic habit of biting your cheek? And um, gastrointestinal reflux. So gastrointestinal reflux happens when stomach acid comes up your esophagus and sometimes can even come into the mouth. And not only do we see um, reflux coming into the mouth, it also can go um, the back of the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, which is your voice box. And a lot of times, 
this kind of reflux can be caused by problems during sleep with oxygenation and um, the structure of your mouth and throat, which causes problems with low oxygenation and a collapsed airway during sleep. And with the alterations in the pressure between your mouth, your stomach, and your lungs, um, that acidic stomach fluid gets pulled up into the back of the mouth and throat and can be a cause of burning. And so you want to rule out whether you have a problem with gastrointestinal reflux, reflux of acidic stomach contents into the back of your throat and mouth, which will cause burning also. There are other things that can cause burning. So um, vitamin deficiencies, such as the B vitamins, vitamin B12 and zinc, can cause nerves to malfunction. And we see that um, in people who have certain chronic illnesses where they have low B vitamins. Um, Sjogren's is an autoimmune disorder with true dry mouth. And people with Sjogren's syndrome can have a burning tongue. And we try to distinguish, is it Sjogren's autoimmune or is it burning mouth syndrome? And one of the big distinguishing features is that people with Sjogren's have not only dry mouth, they have dry eyes. So if you're somebody with dry eyes as well as dry mouth, this can be a distinguishing factor in whether you have Sjogren's, which is autoimmune, which requires somewhat different type of treatment, um, or burning mouth syndrome. Diabetics are known for having neuropathy or a malfunction of their nerves. And it's possible, and it's usually the nerves um, on the feet and the legs. It could also be hands. And it also can end up showing up in people's mouths. So you want to rule out whether you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, having problems with regulating blood sugar and blood sugars being too high. And then medications can cause burning in the mouth. And there's one particular class called the um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. And they have names that end in PRIL, like lisinopril and captopril. And for some people, changing from this type of medication to another blood pressure medication will give some relief of burning. And let's talk about misconceptions because for me, this has been one of the most um, concerning features in people suffering from burning mouth syndrome, that it's all in your head, that you're anxious, you're depressed, um, some of the scientific articles actually said it was cancer phobia, fear of cancer that made people have burning in their mouth, that it was stress, that it's a somatization disorder, meaning instead of feeling your feelings, if you're really sad, you'll get a stomach ache. And there are some people who have trouble expressing their feelings and they will get aches and pains as their way of saying that they're emotionally not feeling good. But this certainly is not a somat somatization disorder. This is has a physical basis. Does anxiety, depression, and stress play a role? For sure, but I'm gonna tell you how. There's definite physiologic reasons for how these things are tied together. First of all, any chronic pain syndrome causes depression. We know that. And, um, if you compare people with burning mouth syndrome to age match controls, um, more than 50% of the burning mouth people will have depression and anxiety. But if you look at other chronic pain syndromes, you'll find that the rates of depression and anxiety are similar because living with chronic pain is really difficult. And then there was an article that I honestly, I couldn't believe it when I read it. Um, this article said that, um, and it basically is referring to women because of course that's mainly who has burning mouth syndrome. Um, people watching upsetting soap operas on TV is the reason why they're having burning mouth syndrome. And that actually was in a scientific article, believe it or not. And the problem with healthcare professionals is they assume just because we can't see anything and there's no testing for it, that it's gotta be in your head. 
and that's wrong. So we're going to talk about really what is burning mouth syndrome and what do we know about it currently. Before I do that, I want to talk to you about different types of pain, acute pain and chronic pain, because this comes into play. Acute pain serves a number of functions, right? If you put your hand near a flame, you feel pain, and it's a signal to your body to withdraw your hand from that danger. So it helps us get out of danger. The other thing that it can do, if you twist your ankle, yeah, it hurts right when you twist it, and it keeps hurting for a while. And what that does is tell us to take care of it and not put weight on it and not go about our everyday activities as if it didn't happen because it needs to be immobilized for a while so that it can heal. So acute pain serves us protective and healing functions. And it keeps us alive. People that are born without pain sensations generally die much earlier than average age because they do not feel the pain that warns them that danger is there. Chronic pain ends up being something where it's not related to what's just happened. If you have an acute pain, if you get a tiny cut on your finger, it hurts a little. If you get a great big gash, it hurts a lot. And what happens with chronic pain is that you lose the relationship between the amount of damage to the tissue and the amount of pain. And so you end up with the situation where a very small initial insult can end up magnifying into a very large pain. It can be more intense than what the original insult would call for. It can be over a larger area of, you know, the initial insult might have been the tip of your finger, now your whole arm hurts. Um, and eventually it takes on a life of its own. So even though the initial insult is over, the pain keeps going. And these are the characteristics of chronic pain, which is what burning mouth syndrome is. And pain is a two-way street. So we're aware of pain as a sign of danger, right? You put your hand near a burning flame, you withdraw it because it feels hot and you keep yourself from getting hurt. That's not the only thing that happens. The, the message from the tip of your finger that there's something super hot there that goes to your brain and then your brain pulls your hand back. There also are, it's a two-way street, there are pain inhibiting messages that go from your brain to the tip of your finger. And that's going on all the time when we sense pain. Pain goes up, pain dampening signals come down. When there's a mismatch and you don't get enough dampening signals, all you get are pain sensations going up to your brain all the time, telling your brain that there's a bad pain going on. And the other way that pain is a two-way street is in your nerves, there are always two processes going on. One is inflammation and it's part of telling your body to get out of danger and to rest and heal. So inflammation is normal, healthy, and protective as long as it doesn't run away with itself and become chronic. And some of the factors that, the chemicals that are inflammatory factors in our nerves are things like histamine and something called CGRP. And these are inflammatory irritants to nerves. On the other hand, we have a number of healing chemicals. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is very healing and calming to nerves. And the innate repair receptor in nerves is very calming to nerves. So we have these two things going on all the time that are part of the balance of keeping us healthy so that we can get out of danger. But when it becomes a chronic problem, and when things aren't going properly, you, don't, you have too much of the inflammation, which causes pain, and not enough of the healing factors. And so our therapy needs to be geared at calming the inflammation and increasing the healing factors. And how do we do that? I'll tell you in a little while. I've just finished talking about what BMS is. So it's a chronic pain, and it's a neuropathic pain. 
And neuropathy means a disease or a disorder of nerves, which typically causes numbness, weakness, or pain. And um, for burning mouth, it's pain and burning. Uh, neuropathic pain also doesn't follow necessarily a typical um, pain pathway. So if you have a pinched nerve in your neck, you'll, and it's on the right side, you'll feel pain down your right arm. With neuropathic pain, it can all of a sudden be on the other side of your body, or be lower down, or be higher up. It starts to take on a life of its own, and it's not limited to what we see with an acute insult, an acute injury. Uh, this is one really interesting um, lesson in burning mouth syndrome. So dopamine is a neurochemical. It's a neurotransmitter. It's in our brains, and it's our reward hormone. So um, you've heard of dopamine and like um, social media or texting on your phone. You know, you get excited, you look forward to getting a new text, and that releases dopamine. Um, dopamine is also what gives people initiative and drive to get things done to achieve a goal. Um, dopamine also lessens pain. And when they did specific dopamine brain scans in people with burning mouth syndrome, their scans looked like people with Parkinson's disease. And what do we know about Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a low dopamine disease. The areas in the brain that are sensitive to dopamine become injured and um, resistant to dopamine and don't function well anymore. And people end up with a tremor and difficulty walking. So those are different neurological consequences. But the fact is, it's been proven that dopamine levels are low in the brain of people with burning mouth syndrome. So you have lost some of your pain dampening chemicals when your dopamine levels go down. And low dopamine also can cause depression and anxiety. So this is the, one of the physiologic connections between having pain and the depression and anxiety. So you not only are depressed and anxious because you're having pain and you can't do the things you want to do in life and your life is severely impacted, you actually have a physiologic reason, which is low dopamine that is occurring with burning mouth and um, with depression and anxiety as a cause of depression and anxiety. It's not in your head. What else have studies shown? Um, when they've done biopsies and looked at the tongues of people with burning mouth syndrome, the pain receptors and the nerve growth factors were different. So BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that's a wonderful healing factor for nerves. There wasn't as much in burning mouth patients. And when they did specialized stains, looking at the nerves in the tongue biopsy, they could see that the nerves were degenerated. The nerves didn't look normal. And other MRI brain imaging showed changes in the brain. So we do, in fact, um, these are more um, like research tools. We don't do biopsies in everybody with burning mouth. Um, but the fact is, these are showing us definite reasons on testing why, you know, that something is going on that's not normal. And then this is a, a big clue. Who gets BMS? So it's estimated that anywhere from less than a percent to up to 15% of the population has burning mouth syndrome. And um, different parts of the world and different studies report different percentages of the population. We know that it tends to increase in frequency as people get older. And it occurs far more in women than it does in men. And depending on the study that you look at, it's anywhere from three women to every man who gets it up to 20 women to every man who gets burning mouth syndrome. And I have to say, I've seen far more women than men, and I would say it's probably in 10 or 20 to one ratio. A large percentage of women who have had their ovaries removed surgically have oral pain. 
they lose their hormones, and they have pain in their mouth. Um, the average age of getting burning mouth syndrome for women is age 60. If men have it, they usually get it at an older age. It's very unusual to see burning mouth syndrome in women under age 30 or in men under age 40. So it occurs later and less frequently for men. And this to me is the real clue to where things are. 90% of burning mouth syndrome occurs in perimenopausal and menopausal women. Hormones play a role for sure. And rarely in women under 30. If age 30, you should be hormonally your optimal in life, somewhere between age 25 and 30. Your hormones should be great. That's not necessarily true in this modern day and age. Uh, we have toxins in the environment. We have stress. Um, we don't have the greatest food supply, um, so we're lacking some micronutrients. So um, I would say people are not as optimized as they could be between age 25 and 30, but that's when we are functioning hormonally at our best. And as time goes on, and especially with the changes in menopause, and we'll talk about that, we see the rise in burning in the mouth. There are lots of protective hormones, protective against or your nerves, and they decline with age, and this is a list of them. Thyroid hormone goes down with age. Human growth hormone goes down with age. Testosterone goes down with age. DHEA, which is our energy and vitality hormone, by the time you're in your mid-40s, it's half of what it was when you were in your late 20s. Pregnenolone, very nerve protective, important for your memory. It goes down, down, down as we age. Melatonin goes down, harder to go to sleep the older you get. And oxytocin, which is known as the cuddle hormone, goes down as we get older. And then the other thing that happens with menopause is that we lose our estrogen and progesterone, which are hugely protective. And the other thing that happens with age Everything's going down, 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 or disappearing, except for cortisol, our stress hormone. And it goes up with age and up with stress. And guess what? Cortisol damages nerves. We know that stress impacts the brain. We work a lot with patients with cognitive decline. Stress actually shrinks your brain by damaging nerves in your brain. And it can damage nerves anywhere in your body. So. We don't know the original triggering cause of burning mouth syndrome, like what made the nerves degenerate, but we certainly know many of the factors that can make it better and can make it worse. And we know stress plays a large role because going back to the initial patient I told you about, our fitness instructor, she got on her hormone restoration program. Her burning tongue was way better. A uh, couple of years later, she had a divorce. And with all the stress of the divorce, her burning tongue got worse again. And so we know that stress plays a role, cortisol plays a role um, in, in uh, damaging nerves and allowing this process to happen again. And I've seen that in more than one patient where they get their pain is greatly diminished, they're functioning pretty well, and then a very stressful event occurs and their pain comes back or increases. It doesn't mean it's forever. If stress declines, we adjust their hormones, we work on stress reduction techniques, we work on things that keep cortisol from doing as much damage as it does, and we have supplements to do that, and pain will generally diminish again. So what you have in perimenopausal and menopausal women is what I call the perfect storm. There's been some nerve damage. We don't exactly know what the reason is, and that's something that we're still trying to figure out. There's hormone decline, and there's <clears throat> psychological stress. And even if you don't feel really stressed at menopause, what happens with your loss of estrogen is you lose a lot of your stress resilience. And uh, estrogen is an incredible buffer and anti-inflammatory and diminishes your stress response physiologically. 
And we see it in our patients who say, you know, I used to be able to juggle so many things, be so even tempered, I could handle anything. And I went through menopause and now I can't do it. I get stressed and I can't handle it. And a lot of that is loss of estrogen. So it's a combination of things that go on that I think come together and result in burning mouth syndrome. So we'll go on and talk about treatment now. And I'm gonna tell you about the things that are typically done. I'll tell you about what I've seen work and not work. And then I'll tell you about the innovative things that we've been using at the SCLAR Center. So for neuropathic pain, for many people, whether it's diabetics or people who have had a back injury that's now converted to neuropathic pain, antidepressant and anti-seizure medications are very commonly given. Um, the typical antidepressants can be the modern ones like Prozac or can be some of the original kind of first generation ones like amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Um, the problems with amitriptyline and nortriptyline is one of their side effects is dry mouth. So if your mouth already feels like it's dry, that can be um, a problematic side effect. Gabapentin is an anti-seizure medication that is given very frequently for neuropathic pain. Um, it blocks some of the excitatory nerve chemicals or neurotransmitters that we think are pain producing. Um, the problem with gabapentin and um, actually most of these, Prozac and amitriptyline, is we haven't seen them work very well in burning mouth patients, or at least the people that are coming to see me have been on them and still are having a lot of pain. The other problem with gabapentin is it can have a lot of side effects. It can make people feel like, and the Vimpat also, um, which may be more successful in alleviating pain, but causes so much sedation and so much brain fog and difficulty thinking that you're trading off pain for not being able to function for another reason. You're too, you're too sedated and foggy. And so, um, and there have been studies done looking at the effectiveness of these things. They don't seem to work all that well for burning mouth syndrome, although they do work in some cases for some people. So I don't discount them. But what I'm saying is the people that come to see us have already been on these things. These are typically what's given by the primary care doctor uh, and internal medicine doctors and pain management specialists. Topical clonazepam. So clonazepam is a sedative in the benzodiazepine family like Valium and Librium and Xanax. Um, it seems to particularly work on the tongue and it does work pretty well for some people. It directly calms the inflamed nerves on the surface of the tongue. And so the way it's recommended to be used is you take this little tablet, put it on your tongue and let it melt for three to four minutes, moving it around in your mouth to the different areas that are the most painful. And at the end of the three or four minutes, you spit out the residue. And what this does is um, make it less likely that you're gonna build up tolerance and get addicted to it. And um, it helps because it's directly working on the nerves on the tongue. And one study showed that 40% of patients got some relief from this. And it seemed to help not only with the pain, but with the altered taste, that abnormal metallic or salty taste sensation and the sensation of dry mouth. So it's certainly worth trying. Just about everybody who comes to see me is on mouth moisturizers of one kind or another. And Biotin is um, a company that really promotes treatment for dry mouth. Uh, it may help somewhat. It certainly doesn't help the burning. And I looked at some of their products. Some have parabens in them, which are toxic. So you wanna, if you're gonna use their products, be sure and check to see if on the um, contents, it says that it has parabens or not, and pick something that doesn't. I had read about this topical capsaicin and I recently had a patient who actually had used it. And capsaicin is the chemical that makes chili peppers hot. And uh, capsaicin does a couple of things. It lowers histamine, which I explained to you before, is one of the inflammatory chemicals in nerves. And it also lowers substance P, which is a chemical that causes pain. 
And what people do is use hot sauce or a capsaicin formula from a compounding pharmacy, put it on their tongues. Initially, it burns like crazy because it stimulates those capsaicin, which are now called vanilloid receptors, but it can end up blunting them after a period of time. And this one study I saw anywhere from 20 up to 80% of people improved after a year of using capsaicin. Um, a third of people can't tolerate it because it's too painful. And the patient that um, I met who had used this and had her pain reduced had dry mouth as a, her still very significant symptom. So there are articles about the use of capsation and you'll see it in the literature. Um, mast cells are white blood cells that come to an area of damage and release their chemicals, presumably to kill viruses or bacteria that are in the area. And one of the things that they release is histamine, which I've mentioned before. And there is a doctor named Dr. Lawrence Afrin who has a small series of um, four or six patients with burning mouth syndrome that he saw and um, prescribed um, histamine blockers. And histamine blockers are things like Pepsid or famotidine, um, claritin, which is an antihistamine for environmental allergies, also called loratadine, and um, also using something called Celebrex. Uh, we tried this on some of our patients and it did not diminish their pain. So I'm not sure if he had a certain subset of patients with mast cell activation where these white blood cells would release histamine and cause their pain but we did not find that it worked well in our patients. Certainly using things like Pepsid and Claritin are um, not harmful, especially in the short run to try it out, so it might be worth a try. Uh, low level laser, so this is a type of healing light that brings oxygen and blood flow to an area of damage. And it may be helpful for um, some patients. Um, there, you know, a lot of these things, there's like a study that shows benefit and then there are a lot of studies that don't. So, um, but one of the studies um, showed that people who use the laser three times a week had a significant decrease in their pain and an improvement in their quality of life measures. So they actually were able to function better in life. Um, there also was a placebo group and we always have to rule out, you know, what is the placebo effect and what's the effect of the laser or the medication. And the placebo group had some improvement, but the treatment group with the low level laser um, actually improved more. Um, and then there were other studies that showed that pain got better, but quality of life didn't improve. So um, this is something that is certainly not harmful to try um, and may work for some people. And then what about supplements? So alpha lipoic acid is, I think, pretty well known to people in, who've been researching burning mouth who have it. It's um, a supplement that has worked well for people with diabetic neuropathy. There was a group in Italy that did a number of studies showing benefits of using alpha lipoic acid for burning mouth syndrome, but nobody else was able to reproduce the results of those studies. So. Um, it casts some doubt on it, but it's certainly, um, it's an antioxidant. It has virtually no side effects and it's certainly worth trying. Um, this is a picture of a 300 milligram alpha lipoic acid. Uh, for people who want to try it, we recommend using 600 milligrams two or three times a day in order to give it a try and see if it works. And then there's cognitive behavioral therapy, which is not a way of saying it's in your head, but it is a way of trying to um, reframe negative thoughts and relieve stress. And um, studies with burning mouth syndrome showed significantly decreased pain in people who underwent this kind of therapy. Some of it was short term, like they had three sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, some people had longer term, like 10 to 15 sessions. And what it tells me is it points to the very significant effect of stress in burning mouth syndrome and other chronic pain conditions. So not saying it's in your head, but saying that stress releases a whole cascade of chemicals that worsens pain and, and irritates nerves. 
So what about some newer um, hormones and cutting edge treatments? There are, in spite of the fact that 90% of the people that have burning mouth syndrome are perimenopausal and menopausal women, I have searched the literature for the last 40 years, and there are maybe four or five studies in burning mouth looking at hormones. And they all showed benefit. Um, they didn't use bioidentical hormones always like the ones that we use but it seemed like almost regardless of what type of hormones, estrogen and progesterone they use, especially estrogen, um, it helped. And so this is one study um, from the um, Journal of Oral Surgery and Oral Medicine and Oral Pathology from a long time ago, from 1989. And um, there was less depression, more ability to cope, and two thirds of the women experienced decreased mouth pain. And so this really speaks to the benefits of hormones. And why is that? And so we're gonna get into why do hormones work? What do they do? There are a couple of classes of hormones. One are the steroid hormones and all of the hormones listed on the left-hand side are steroid hormones. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, and vitamin D. You might say, well, what's vitamin D doing in there? But when you look at the chemical structure of vitamin D, it in fact is a steroid. And vitamin D functions very much as a steroid hormone. And I put this in here and mention that they're steroid hormones because people worry when they hear the term steroids, they think about steroid abuse and they think about damaging the things that happen, say in the bodybuilding world with people abusing steroids and having a uh, organ damage and adverse consequences. So you can abuse anything and um, the steroids that are used in bodybuilding are generally synthetic steroids and they do have a lot of side effects and we don't use those. But I just wanna to explain to you so you don't worry that using steroids is a bad thing. And steroids are not only made in our ovaries um, and adrenal glands, steroids are actually made in the nerves in your brain and in your nerves in other parts of your body. And they're called neurosteroids. And they have tremendous healing and protective value. And then there are the non-steroid hormones that also benefit burning mouth syndrome, thyroid, melatonin, and oxytocin. And we're gonna go through each of these and explain them. So first we want to address, are hormones okay? Because everyone's heard about the Women's Health Initiative, which it's actually almost 20 years since the results came out. And it still makes big news when it hits the papers. And somebody has revisited the Women's Health Initiative and once again come up with hormones are dangerous. Well, they used the wrong hormones in that study. Um, the company that made Premarin was sure that Premarin was going to be shown to be a fabulous advantage and raise it to even more of a blockbuster drug than it was. And that didn't happen. And they used Provera, which is a synthetic progesterone that it does in fact increase risk of breast cancer. And it's still on the market. I honestly don't know why, but we certainly don't use it. And so we find that, and studies have backed this up, that if we use bioidentical hormones, meaning the same chemical structure as the hormones our own bodies make, we do not see an increase in breast cancer, uterine cancer, um, cardiovascular disease. In fact, we see reduced rates of Alzheimer's. People who are, women who are on hormones in menopause have half the rate of Alzheimer's disease as women who are not on hormones. We see protection in the cardiovascular system and a number of other benefits um, that I won't go into right now. But hormones are healing, protective and pain relieving. And as I mentioned with estrogen, when we lose our estrogen, we lose a huge anti-inflammatory um, impact on our bodies. Um, estrogen is made in lots of places, primarily in our ovaries, but as I mentioned, it's also made in our brains and our nerves. Why is estrogen made in a nerve? What would it do there? It doesn't have anything to do with reproduction and having babies because estrogen does a lot more than that. It has anti-inflammatory properties. It calms the pain pathways, especially in the head and the face. And it reduces that pain-producing inflammation. 
It protects and regenerates nerves. So you have damaged nerves that are causing you pain. You want to regenerate new healthy nerves that will then function normally. And estrogen helps with that regeneration. I, I picture nerves and nerve stem cells as like, you know, a little tiny seedling and you put it in um, a pot with fertilizer or even better compost and you water it and you give it sunlight and it grows up into a big, beautiful plant. And that's what we want to see new little baby nerves do. Um, estrogen, uh, I mentioned before, calms the stress response and lowers the release of cortisol, that very nerve damaging hormone. And what about progesterone? Progesterone, first of all, we know it's very brain calming. It helps with sleep, it helps with mental focus, it helps with anxiety. And um, it is pain relieving and increases endorphin release. So you know what narcotic pain relievers are, right? Like oxycodone and um, Dilaudid and codeine. We make our own internal pain relievers and they're called endorphins. And progesterone and it's a very important metabolite breakdown product, allopregnanolone, protect nerves, calm pain, and increase are natural pain relieving chemicals. And what about testosterone? It's good for women as well as men. And testosterone is an important pain decreasing hormone. And in addition for women, men have lots of good benefits from testosterone in terms of mood and energy. And women also get energy from testosterone. But the one thing that's been found in women is that testosterone improves overall sense of well-being. And goodness knows, if you have chronic pain, you need something to improve your well-being, right? Um, this is pregnenolone. We um, have in the past had pregnenolone at the Sklar Center as a supplement. It's available as a supplement. It is one of the very important neurosteroids made in nerves, made in your brain, protects nerves, what causes burning mouth syndrome? We don't know if it's some toxic assault, if it's um, a viral or um, something like Lyme. We really don't know what gets it going, but we do know that these hormones protect your nerves against toxic assaults. And again, pregnenolone is a chemical that is one of your body's own natural pain relievers. Um, DHEA restores injured nerves and DHEA goes down when you get stressed. So how you make your cortisol is DHEA is an intermediate, intermediate step. And if you're very stressed and you're making a lot of cortisol, you are converting a lot of your DHEA into cortisol and having lower DHEA levels in your body. And we actually see this in our stress patients when we do their lab testing. If they've been through a really stressful time in life, their DHEA is low. And um, DHEA restores injured nerves. So you lose some of your nerve restoration ability. And they have done studies on the saliva of people with burning mouth syndrome. Their morning saliva has decreased DHEA. So in their mouth, they are not having as much DHEA to help those nerves in the mouth um, as they should be. And vitamin D, does similar things. I hate to sound like a broken record, but reducing inflammation, protecting against toxins, and helping to make healing nerve factors. And what about thyroid? So one of the kind of scientific uh, trends for a while was to say um, we wouldn't call it burning mouth unless we ruled out thyroid problems. And this is a study done on 123 women who had burning mouth syndrome and 123 women who didn't have burning mouth syndrome. Um, and of the group with burning mouth syndrome, well, far more had low thyroid function, 58, compared to 13 in the group without burning mouth syndrome. And when they gave thyroid treatment, two thirds of the symptoms resolved in the women with burning mouth syndrome. So there definitely is a thyroid connection. And what about melatonin? So we think of melatonin as being the sleep hormone, and this little kitty is having a lovely nap. 
Um, but melatonin has potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. And the same as the other hormones, helps the healing of nerves and Oxytocin is um, one of our newer holding a lot of promise. So oxytocin is the birth and nursing, breastfeeding hormone. And I mean, how do we get through labor if we didn't have oxytocin? So um, there is growing evidence of oxytocin relieving pain associated with headaches, chronic back pain, irritable bowel syndrome, and other types of pain. It's made in the hypothalamus, which is our part of our brain that is our master hormone regulating gland. Um, it then acts on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our stress axis, and at times of stress or pain, the hypothalamus releases surges of oxytocin into the brain and out to the nerves in the extremities. So oxytocin stimulates your own natural pain-killing receptors, the opioid. We have opioid receptors in our brains and in our nerves. Our endorphins that we make, our natural pain relievers, attach to those opioid receptors. And um, oxytocin um, stimulates the receptors and lowers pain. And so um, the spinal cord is the initial site of pain transmission from your tongue up to your brain and oxytocin blocks the pain sensation in the spinal cord neurons. That's where chronic pain gets amplified in your spinal cord. And so it has calming effects um, on that area of the spinal cord and prevents that amplification or enlargement of pain that happens with chronic neuropathic pain. It has calming effects on the amygdala, which is the fear center in the brain. So, that's a key factor in negative emotions and reaction to pain. And oxytocin decreases the production of cortisol, which then reduces symptoms related to stress and reduces pain. So there are many ways in which oxytocin helps and we are currently using it as a nasal spray because it can get directly into the brain through your nose and up into it. There's a very thin bony um, porous plate between your nose and your brain. And so nasal sprays are a good way to get medications to the brain. We also use a medication called low-dose naltrexone. And low-dose naltrexone, so naltrexone has been used for opioid overdose. It uh, will block the opioid receptor. So if somebody's had an overdose, the opioids they've overdosed with will not be able to attach to nerves and cause damage and depress breathing and an overdose and stopping breathing and eventually, you know, cutting off your oxygen and dying. It's been found that if you use naltrexone in very low doses, it doesn't block the opioid receptors. It does the exact opposite. It stimulates them and it reduces pain. And it reduces inflammation as well. We use it a lot for autoimmune um, patients. And so it activates your natural pain receptors in your brain and in your nerves. It's extremely safe. It has virtually no side effects. It can sometimes cause, um, it can cause insomnia. It's usually a short-lived side effect. If you can wait it out for a week or two, it wears off. Um, some people have very vivid dreams, too, viz too vivid, un unpleasant. So we tell them to take it in the morning rather than at bedtime. But it certainly has no serious side effects. Um, it's considered experimental and off-label. It has not been developed by Big Pharma because they're not interested in developing it because it's really very cheap and they're not gonna make a ton of money off of it. So it's made by compounding pharmacies, it's legal. And um, we find that it's very helpful for what we call central pain disorders. So that is neuropathic pain that now no longer is in your tongue, it's also in your brain, which is where all neuropathic pain disorders are. And so anytime that a pain has gotten and developed into a neuropathic pain, low dose naltrexone can be very helpful. 
and it's a capsule and you take it at bedtime. Uh, new on the horizon are what are called peptides. And um, they have represented an amazing advance in restor restorative medicine. They're signaling molecules. They tell our cells what to do. And what's really wonderful about peptides is they don't just dampen your inflammatory response across the board or upregulate this or that across the board. They actually um, help our poorly working cells thrive and become healthy and efficient again. And what this means is more nourishing factors like BDNF getting produced, fewer of the inflammatory factors, and reducing pain on the, that pain highway I showed you about. So peptides hold out tremendous promise for many, many chronic pain conditions, including burning mouth syndrome. And that's the latest and greatest on that. So looking to the future, um, just to reiterate, it's not in your head, no matter what you've been told, there really is something going on. We know what you're going through. I've heard so many stories from so many different people and I can appreciate the impact that this kind of pain has on your life. The problem is you look okay. Nobody sees anything wrong. I actually had a patient tell me she had had breast cancer and she went through radiation and chemotherapy and she said, you know what? It is nothing compared to the burning mouth syndrome. It was something that people knew what to do about. They treated me and it's over and done. And this is unending. Um, we have a good success rate in people who are on our complete restoration program using all the things that I told you about. It's kind of like juggling balls. It's hormones and low dose naltrexone and oxytocin. Um, about 75% success rate, meaning people's pain gets significantly diminished. Does it go away completely? Not usually. It's often there from time to time in some low level. Um, it, we are not curing it. If you stop treatment, the burning comes back. It's not curative. It doesn't end it. So I like people to understand that. Um, but we are able to help people. I remember somebody telling me, I had Thanksgiving with my family for the first time in four years because before I couldn't eat anything and it was embarrassing and I didn't wanna go and not be able to eat this and eat that and have to explain what was going on. And she said, I had Thanksgiving with my family. So, you know, so much of our socializing goes on around food that if you are not able to eat and you're limited and you're in pain when you eat, um, you tend to withdraw. Any chronic pain conditions withdraw, but people withdraw and become isolated. But especially with burning mouth because the whole issue of eating and food is such a huge one. Um, know that our understanding of burning mouth is increasing all the time. And so as I am constantly reading, I know those of you with burning mouth syndrome are constantly on the internet searching. I hear from you all the time. And just know that I am constantly on the internet looking for the latest treatments and the latest so that I can relieve your pain. Um, we have a way for you to get a copy of the slideshow. If you would like to be on our email list, let us know. If you would like a consult about your burning mouth or another subject, you can contact our office. And so if you text this number, 562-280-2191, and put in your name, phone number, and email, and let us know what you would like. Do you want the slideshow? Do you want to be on our email list? Or would you like a consult? Somebody will get back to you in the next few days. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I have not looked at the chat. Let's see, I'm going to stop the share. And we have questions in the chat. OK. Um, yeah, so somebody said, um, sinuses and throat as well as mouth tongue and lips i can relate to all of this and no it's not in my head mine was diagnosed and told sorry something you just have to live with um, somebody else said extreme dry mouth and eyes and bms so um, as i mentioned if you have dry eyes and dry mouth um, you may want to get uh, look into 
whether you have, um, let me just get the right view here. Um, you might want to look into whether you could have Sjogren syndrome and that can be diagnosed with um, blood testing. Let's see, and this is somebody who um, said she has burning uh, from the minute you open your eyes until you go to bed, doesn't taste food, ears are ringing, headaches for five, five years, and it started when you had teeth removed and started with an upper and lower partial. And then you've started allergy testing to ingredients in the partials. And um, regardless, um, it's also possible that hormones are playing a role. I don't know what your age is. Um, hormones, yes, I was 47, and that certainly is the age. Perimenopause actually probably starts around age 35, goes on for about 15 years until actual menopause, which is average age of 51. Um, what about male menopause? Um, so men don't actually have an abrupt drop off in their hormones, but certainly men, as they proceed through life, have lower and lower testosterone levels. And a testosterone, as I explained, is a great uh, pain reliever. And it's possible for men that low testosterone happening as they get later in life. And this person, you're 52, um, you're midlife, but still your testosterone level is probably about half of what it was when you were young, um, may be helpful. Um, somebody asked about surgeries such as um, a radio ganglion block blockade. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, except for one patient who had surgery and it did not change their pain. Um, so um, I don't have a wide knowledge about um, surgery for the pain. Um, Somebody wanted the number again. Let's see. Uh, the text number, it's in the chat, 562-280-2191. Let's see. Could it be hereditary? I have not heard of it being hereditary. Um, this person said your, their dad had Parkinson's. Um, Parkinson's is often caused by toxins, environmental toxins. So I would say, as far as I know, burning mouth is not hereditary. Certainly, certain autoimmune diseases seem to have a genetic or hereditary component. And Parkinson's does, I really don't know about burning mouth. Um, here's somebody who developed it postpartum. Well, you know, when you're postpartum, you have the hormones of a menopausal woman. You have no estrogen and no progesterone. Um, and if you're nursing, that continues on. Uh, we see women whose, for example, vaginal lining look like a 50 or 60 year old woman because there is no estrogen and the vaginal tissues become very thinned out. So clear to us that there is lack of estrogen and it's, um, it's possible that that had triggered this. Um, Is it connected to immunoglobulins? So immunoglobulins are our little fighting army that fights bacteria and uh, viruses. And um, people with low immunoglobulins are definitely more susceptible to infection. I don't know if they're more susceptible to burning mouth syndrome. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Um, somebody who's 66 asked if estrogen is okay for all ages of senior women. So my view of um, hormones is that you're never too old to start on hormones, and particularly if it's for relief of a pain condition. The hormones that we give are safe. They don't cause increased risk of blood clots. They don't cause breast cancer. I know the traditional medical establishment says that you know if you're over age 55 or 60 you shouldn't be started on hormones but honestly that does not have scientific basis it's just kind of guessing at what's okay or not okay and that's true for a lot of the information that comes through about hormone use there isn't really a sound um, a scientific basis it's just um, you know doctors getting together and saying oh you know I don't think it seems like such a good idea 
not because necessarily there has been found to be any harm. So we do use um, hormones on, uh, on women, like I said, regardless of age. Um, information on burning mouth. There's quite a bit of information on our website. Uh, if you go to sclarcenter.com, we have a couple of blogs and uh, a discussion about treatment for burning mouth. Um, a discussion of peptides. So peptides are not over the counter. Peptides are a prescription. And right now, peptides are somewhat under attack by the Food and Drug Administration uh, because pharmaceutical companies are trying to get a corner on that market. And so the federal government keeps coming out with uh, regulations and even if you, the, the pharmacy is functioning within the regulations, they're still told they can't make peptides. So um, they're getting a bit harder to find, but there are pharmacies that make peptides. We stay in touch with pharmacies that make them and are able to get them. Um, so I hope that answers your question about the peptides. Um, heavy metal toxicity. Um, there hasn't seemed to be a connection. Mercury has been studied and did not seem to necessarily uh, be a causative factor. Um, certainly there's a whole issue of mercury and mercury toxicity. We see people with fatigue, we see people with cognitive decline because of mercury, but um, heavy metals have not so far been implicated in burning mouth. And I say so far because we have so much to learn about this. Yeah, somebody mentioned if you have dry mouth issues to get to a knowledgeable dentist because dry mouth can lead to um, gum disease and tooth decay. So you definitely need to use products so that that doesn't happen. We refer people to what are called biological or holistic dentists. And you can find one in your area by looking in the um, IAOMT, the International Association of uh, Oral and uh, Medical Toxicology, I-O-A-M-T. Um, right, so somebody said that um, they took uh, DHEA and alpha lipoic acid ordered from my office, but they never seem to help. So we have a product called Burning Mouth Advanced Support that has alpha lipoic acid DHEA and pregnenolone in it, along with um, a B, vitamin B12. Um, I did a small study on it, and about a third, a quarter to a third of people got relief using the supplement. And we certainly have people that order it year after year because they're getting relief from it. If you didn't get relief from those things, it may be that it wasn't sufficient amounts or that it wasn't the full complement of hormones. We know that people get better relief when they are on the full hormone restoration program, which means becoming a patient at the Sklar Center because um, the other hormones, DHEA and pregnenolone are available as supplements, but the other hormones are prescription. Let's see, um, somebody had said it started after brushing their teeth with activated charcoal. So that's interesting because activated charcoal absorbs toxins. So I honestly um, can't think of like a physiologic connection of why that would have happened. Um, let's see, someone who's had burning mouth condition for three years, um, and treatments, I guess we've worked with people. It doesn't seem to matter how long you've had burning mouth syndrome. Um, we've had people respond even who have had it for many years. Um, can you just have burning lips and have burning mouth? Um, absolutely. We see people with any combination of burning the tip of their tongue, their mouth, the cheek. Um, and so yes, that's certainly possible that that could be your only sign. Um, Let's see, and somebody had relief with alpha lipoic acid, R lipoic at 600, but has hair loss. Um, I'm not sure why that would happen because it's an antioxidant, which usually doesn't, usually helps hair, it doesn't injure hair. So um, 
I'd want to know more about that. And then biotin, is it okay to take with BMS? Absolutely, biotin. Just try to get the products that don't have the parabens because um, they're toxins. You, you don't want to be on. We get exposed to a lot of toxins in the course of our everyday life. You don't want to um, get exposed to toxins unnecessarily, especially putting things in your mouth. Parabens are in a lot of health and beauty aids. Um, so they're in lotions, they're in cosmetics, and what you put on your skin gets absorbed. So, and the same thing is true for biotin, it will get absorbed. So try to find the one that doesn't have parabens in it. Let's see, and that looks like all of the questions so far. I'll wait a couple more um, minutes and- um, Dr. Sklar, I got a few that, um, I got, this is Jessica, I got a few that was just to me. Um, sure. So when was, someone was curious if Crohn's disease is a trigger? Wow. Well, Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disorder, and it certainly creates stress. I would say any significant illness that creates stress could be a trigger. And the other one is, um, does hormone levels have anything to do with nerve pain in leg or heels? And they're 65. Right. Um, it's possible. And really, you want to know what the cause of the pain is. So if somebody has diabetic neuropathy, we kind of lead them more toward using lipoic acid and trying to get their blood sugars under control. So, um, you know, and if it's pain radiating from the back, from a pinched nerve, it could be a neuropathy and something like the peptides can be helpful. Any other questions, Jessica? Um, that's the that I just got, but a few more have been popped onto the whole group. Right, I see. Um, what's the first step I need to take to start find, to find relief working with our office? Um, if you let us know either through that text or call our office, and our office number is 562-596-5196. Um, we set you up with a consult and um, then we go from there. So I can get some information um, after an initial consult. If it looks like we'll be able to help you, we set up what's called a comprehensive exam. We ask you to fill out a very extensive health history. Um, I spend an hour um, going over it with you, learning the details of your situation. We decide what lab testing would be helpful to start sorting things out. We have you get the lab testing and um, then we meet for a review of results. And at that point, I know a lot about you. I know what your lab tests have shown and I'm able to put a, together a plan to help you start um, getting relief. And so contacting my office or going through the text request, which, you know what, I can put that up again. I can leave that up. Um, let's see. Uh, Jessica, can you read me more of the questions? Because I realize when I have that up, I'm not able to see the chat unless I'm just lame and not seeing it. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, let me see here. <laughs> so um, Graves' disease, is that another trigger? Um, Graves' disease is an autoimmune thyroid problem. Uh, could it be a trigger? Like I said, anything that's a severe stress, it depends on how bad the Graves was. Did it, you know, did, did you have thyroid storm with a um, huge um, high thyroid levels, um, which is extremely stressful? Um, certainly any autoimmune can be a trigger for inflammation other places in the body. So I would say the combination of uh, autoimmune inflammation and the stress that comes from having a significant autoimmune disorder could be a trigger. And then what about antidepre um, antidepressants? Uh, what can they try if antidepressants are not working? Right. If antidepressants are not working, um, well, there's the one called Vimpat, Lacosamide, which um, has helped one patient I talked to. That was the only person I've talked to that got relief from antidepressants you would need to get a doctor to prescribe it. It's prescription. And um, if you're not getting relief from antidepressants, then you wanna start looking at some of the other treatments like hormones, the oxytocin, the low dose naltrexone and the peptides. There's also other like the cognitive behavioral therapy um, and the low level light. So those are some other options. 
Do we ship to Canada? I feel like I should know that. We do. Yes, okay. we do ship to Canada. Mm -hmm. So we can ship BMS advanced support to Canada. Um, is there anything that someone can eat to help with BMS? Um, I can't say that there's any food that particularly helps, but what I routinely see is that people can't tolerate citrus or anything acidic. Tomatoes, citrus fruit, grapefruits. Everybody seems to have um, a different set of foods that may bring them relief or not cause as much irritation. So I can't, I don't really have a blanket dietary recommendation. And usually people know, I mean, you know, because it bothers you when you eat it. And that's the best way to figure out whether you should be eating it or not eating it. Can you list the, um, say the antidepressant that you mentioned again and spell it out for people? They're asking to. Oh, the Vimpat. Sure. V-I-M-P-A-T. And then hypnotherapy. What are your thoughts on hypnotherapy? Um, I have not seen any studies on hypnotherapy and burning mouse syndrome, but I think hypnotherapy can be um, helpful for pain and also for stress relief. Great. That's everything that I see in the chat right now for questions. Anyone else? Great. Well, um, I thank everybody for coming. I appreciate your, I know it went on for a long time. I had a lot to say. I had a lot to tell you about, um, but I do really appreciate your staying on and listening. And I certainly hope that this has been helpful for you and, and can help lead you towards some uh, resolution of your problems. And Dr. Sklar, real quick, I'm yeah. sorry. I missed one question. Sure. I just want to make sure. Oh, sure. Answer. Um, uh, anything to do with the previous spinal or neck injury? Can that trigger BMS? Um, have you seen any links to um, thoracic outlook syndrome? No, uh, I haven't seen a connection to either of those. Yeah, I'm sorry. And then who can prescribe hormones? Um, it depends on where you live, but um, in the U.S., certainly uh, a functional medicine doctor is who you want to see. The endocrinologists, by and large, are very opposed to any mention of bioidentical hormones. They don't want to talk about it. They don't believe in them. So you really want to get either an anti-aging specialist or a functional medicine doctor. And um, we are currently seeing people throughout the country. Um, since COVID has happened, we have um, lowered our requirement that somebody has to come here in person because travel is so difficult. So we are treating people from other states besides California um, without you needing to be seen in person. Let's see, I finally figured out how to see the chat. Um, let's see, any other questions? Is there a specific type of peptides? There are a whole variety of peptides um, that are used in different combinations for neuropathic pain. And um, somebody said, thank you so much. You're very grateful. You're very, very welcome. Uh, the question about geographic tongue. You know, nobody knows exactly what causes uh, geographic tongue. So, um, and we had a patient recently with geographic tongue. It seems to be possibly autoimmune. Um, and she had extreme dry mouth and actually all of the things that we tried for her made her dry mouth so much worse that she couldn't tolerate being on anything long enough to see if it would work. So um, I don't know if we actually can apply this to people with geographic tongue. Um, I was willing to use our autoimmune approaches to geographic tongue and, and that may be helpful, but um, in the, the last patient we had, the only person I've tried to treat for geographic tongue was not successful. Yes, peptides are used for skin. Um, it can help with wrinkles, but peptides also are um, helpful for um, pain, uh, a whole variety of other um, uses. We use peptides for intestinal problems, pain disorders, um, 
chronic kidney disease, uh, cardiac function problems, energy and stamina, sleep, uh, ulcerative colitis. So um, a whole variety of different things can be treated with peptides. Just the cosmetic industry has uh, glommed onto peptides because they can be helpful for helping skin um, and helping wrinkles. Uh, let's see, we've got some more questions. Um, uh, what if the pain sensation is in your gum area? Yes, it still can be burning mouth. Uh, do we take insurance for our services? So people who have um, PPO insurance can certainly use their insurance for all the lab testing uh, or a lot of the lab testing. We do not contract with insurance companies, but we provide you with billing slips so that you are able to um, send it into your insurance company and get some reimbursement. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, yes, have I heard about the hypothesis that burning tongue comes from dysfunction of the corda tympani nerve, which is in, in charge of taste and pain inhibition? Absolutely. And um, the corda tympani uh, is a branch of um, one of the important nerves in the head and um, head and face. And uh, the corda tympani helps to inhibit pain. And so if the corda tympani is not working, you don't get pain inhibition, you just get unremitting pain signals getting sent to the um, brain. And is there a hormonal relationship to that nerve's health? Absolutely. Um, the hormone relationship applies to, to many, many nerves. We see it in cognition and brain function. We see it in relief of uh, mood problems and we see it with burning, burning tongue and burning mouth. Um, terrible taste in the morning. Um, oh, I think I, I don't know if you're the person that asked about it. Um, I responded. Um, it can be a periodontal problem with um, gum disease and um, bacteria that are unhealthy bacteria. It can also be a stomach problem where food is fermenting in your stomach that shouldn't be fermenting there and creating bad gases and um, coming up into your mouth. So um, a holistic dentist and um, um, an intestinal evaluation would be in order. Good, well, it's almost 7.30. Um, I appreciate everybody's engagement, um, staying on for so long and um, being with us to participate in this. And please contact us. Again, our number is 562-596-5196. And um, we hope to hear from you.